I want to invite your attention this weekend to the book of Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, and um, I want to look at verses 17 through 22, 17 through 22, and uh, I'm going to see how we can take this text and connect it to our focus for the day. And so uh, if preaching is going to be done up here, some prayer going to have to be done out there. I need you today, all right? All right. This is how my Bible reads out of the New International Version. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go. God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they may change their mind and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert, around rather by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. And by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. From these verses, I want to preach using as a subject the long way round. The long way, the long way round. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22, we find a remarkable account of how God leads the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. The Bible is very clear at the outset, though, that though the goal was the promised land, God chooses to use a different route. He doesn't go the most direct route But he goes through the wilderness along the Red Sea. And to be sure, this is not an arbitrary decision. It's a part of God's divine strategy. My brothers and sisters, I highlight this as a point of preachment this weekend because the journey of faith is rarely a direct path. A journey to God's purposes and God's promise is rarely a direct path. There are times and seasons in each of our lives when God places us in what appears to be counterintuitive situations that are the opposite of what we believe God has promised us. These are what we call securitous routes, sanctified scenic routes, divine detours, cosmic cul-de-sacs. And it is in these moments when our path is prolonged, and we come up against unexpected challenges. I highlight this as a point of preachment because if we are honest, this is at times the source for believers of some of the mental anxiety that we experience, the feelings of frustration that we experience with God, the doubt that at times that surfaces, that often causes us to question God's plan. Let's be honest, navigating these extended journeys can be mentally taxing. Questioning our own resilience and God's intention because there's a sense of uncertainty and delay that creates these feelings of despair and frustration and anxiety because in these moments, friends, of unexpected challenges, we are faced with something that often leads we don't like talking about when it comes to our Christian faith and its unfulfilled expectations. He, hear what God does again. God sets them on a course toward the promised land out of Egypt. But the goal is the promised land. Before he takes them to the promised land, friends, the Bible tells us that he doesn't take them the direct route. He takes them the long way round. Many, many of us 
thought we'd be further along in our journey by now. We should have had that job by the time we were 25 and got married by the time we were 27 because we wanted to have our first kid before we were 30. And on the surface, it was a logical plan. But God said otherwise. This is hard because direct routes make more sense. All of us are about effectiveness and efficiency, are we not? We thought we'd be at certain places at certain points, but God has taken us the long way around. And many of you, that's the tension point of your current reality. You are grateful for God delivering you from your past. You are grateful for how the Holy Ghost has released you from bondage, from how the Lord has helped you walk through seasons of a previous sin challenge or previous seasons of trauma. You are thankful for how God has delivered you from seasons of past disappointment. But while you are grateful, you're wondering why God is making you wonder when you know you've been made to experience far more than you experience why, why does God take us the long way around why does he lead us into deliberate divine cul-de-sacs and even more friends how do I follow God when I'm not sure where in the world he's taken me when you find yourself in a sovereign, scenic route, it's an invitation to trust the process because God is putting together a providential plan. The text says God makes the intentional decision to lead them out of Egypt to the promised land, but he chooses to take the longer, seemingly more challenging Path. Remember, this is not an arbitrary decision. This is the result of God's providential strategy. God is sovereignly directing his people into what seems like an inescapable situation. Friend, the way God leads us to his greatest blessing sometimes is not the way that we script it. Sometimes when things seem to be strange to us, the way God is leading, you and I have to remember the one who is leading us. That didn't land on you the way I needed it to. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why that surprised me. That it didn't land on you the way I needed it to land on you. Because nothing that happens in our life happens by happenstance. Nothing that happens in our life is haphazard or by chance. God didn't by chance lead them this way. It was part of God's providential plan. Now, when we talk about providence, Sherwin, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about God's invisible hand in our visible human experience. One scholar said it this way relative to this text. He says, the road to paradise never runs in a straight line. The department of... Uh, transportation in Michigan makes sure that when they create roads, they never create roads where we are in a straight line for a long time. There are bends in the road. There are ascents in the road. There are hills that we have to climb. There are valleys of depression that we have to go through. There are bends in the road because if we stay in a straight line for a long period of time, we just kind of zone out. And so God says, sometimes I have to place you in circumstances and in situations whereby you got to experience seasons of heights and depths. You got to go through some bends along the way. And you're wondering why God is taking you in what you know should have been a straight shot. It's because God wants you to recognize, first of all, that nothing that happens in my life happens as a result of accident or chance. And I don't need you to zone out on the journey. I need you to enjoy the journey so that when you get to the place of promise, you would in fact appreciate where you are. And so we trust the process, though we experience seasons of stops and starts, valleys and depressions, reroutes and bends in the road. We can trust the process because we know that God's plan is perfectly wise. You, do you know what shouts me from this text? Here's what shouts me from this text. It's the line that says, so God led the people. 
You know why that shouts me? It shouts me because it's a reminder that where I am, Marlon, God led me there. One Jewish theologian put it this way. The providence of God is like Hebrew words. They can only be read and understood backwards. You see, we read, was it left to right? But in Hebrew, they, they, they understand right to left. And so it's our responsibility to trust God's providence. Everybody say, I am where I am. Because God led me here. One more time, say, I am where I am because God led me here. And what I'm experiencing right now, it may not be my preferred space, but I'm going to thank God for it because God led me here. I didn't plan on being divorced, but God led me here. I didn't think I would have to endure this level of financial distress making this amount of money that I'm making, but I'm here because God has led me here. I'm sure that I would have been further along in my entrepreneurial journey, but I ain't tripping as much as I am because I understand now that where I I am in this space is exactly where God wants me to be. And so what do you do? You got to trust the process because God is providentially putting some things together. But here's the next thing I want to invite you to consider as you go on the journey the long way around. Treasure the fact that God knows what you really need. I'm in verse 17. The B clause into verse 18. Friend, if the children of Israel would have had their way, they would not have chosen to go down the path of the wilderness. They certainly would not have gone along the Red Sea. If it were up to them, they would have taken the shorter route. But the Bible says God takes them the long way around because he knows what lies ahead of us down the road. Here's why I'm thanking God here. Because this is a reminder that though I'm in a space that I didn't desire to be in, I'm there because God placed me there. And I can thank God for where I am, though I don't like where I am, because I understand that God knows what I can handle. For many of us struggle to see what's down the street when God has the capacity to see around the corner. And based on what he knows, God has determined which route is best for us. I thought about this because um, I drove in from Houston uh, uh, last night, had a, a wedding, and I hung out with my family and uh, whatnot. And um, I, I, I probably would have been home sooner if I would have turned my GPS on. <laughs> but the reason why I didn't turn my GPS on was because um, I'm, I'm I'm, while I'm for the most part a patient man, I am not the most patient when I'm driving. In fact, I hate driving, and hate is a strong word. I hate driving to wherever I, I'm going. We're in 2024, and uh, we still ain't figured out how to teleport to be <laughs> where we need to be. Listen, I am waiting for the day when AI allows us to blink, I know, it's coming. I already know it. You just better right, prepare for it. We can blink and be wherever we want to be because I hate the journey to my destination. I hate the process of getting to wherever I got to get to. And so like many of you, when I get in my car, sometimes one of the first things I do is open up my Apple Maps, put in my destination to determine how long it's going to take me to get there, and more importantly, how much patience do I need to pack? <laughs> now, Ms. Joyce, here's, the, here's what's interesting about using Apple Maps. When I put the destination in, the only thing it's going to show me is my next step. And church, I've got to admit that there are times when I get frustrated with the journey because what I see on the map as my next step from my perspective looks like it's going to take me longer to get to the destination. Particularly when I'm driving around Houston, which is home for me, because I know shortcuts. And so instead of focusing in on what my next step is, I use what I think is the best route only to discover that I'm more frustrated because I took a route that led me to a place where they was dealing with an accident. 
And so I'm sitting in traffic, and I can't move at this point. But if I would have just trusted what the GPS told me to do as the next step, if I would have just stayed with the route that Apple Maps gave me, even if it takes me down a route from my perspective that doesn't make sense, I would have been at my destination a whole lot faster. Because when I put my destination in, the reality is, Kim, I got in the car, put the address to where I'm going. The GPS looks down from where it is and gives me the best route and factors in everything that I did not, I can't tell you, friends how many times I've showed up to places later than I should have all because I allowed the frustration of what I saw in front of me when I should have done when, when, when rather what I should have done is trusted the route that was given to me from above me because when I put the information in for my destination the salad night above me factored in all the trouble that I was going to face and determined that in spite of the potential problems that you would find yourself in this route is going to get you to where you need to be in one piece and on time what are you trying to say Pastor V here's what I think God wants us to know we've got a God who doesn't just see the journey just on base what's in front of him but he like the Apple Maps sees everything from above and because his vantage point is so much different from ours whatever route he takes us on is always the best way to proceed I hear the, the, the writer of Proverbs reminding us trust in the Lord I'm starting to feel preach here with all your hearts and lean not to your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path friend the fact that God chooses to lead the Israelites on a longer, seemingly more difficult path reflects not only his power, his position, but it also reflects his providential care and his protection. Because I want you to look at the reason why he doesn't take them the shortest way. The Bible says he takes them the long way around because he knows that on the shorter route, they got to deal with some Philistines. And did I tell you he had just brought them out of slavery? So they don't even know how to fight. Because sometimes, Najee, the direct route is the more dangerous route. God knew what the Israelites could handle. He knew what they couldn't. He knew how unprepared they were for the task that, would have, that was ahead of them. He knew that at the first sign of trouble, these children would have gone running back to what they knew. Have you ever thought that everything that came to you, if everything rather that came to you, came to you as you planned it? Some of that stuff would have made you turn back to the world. Because some of us have known sin strategies no longer than we've known the Savior. And so we know how to handle difficulty from a worldly perspective. But God says, here's what I need you to do. It don't make sense to you right now. But do what I'm telling you to do. Joshua, there's a wall in front of you. And uh, here's what I need you to do. I need you to walk around it and don't say nothing. For six days. And then on the seventh day, I need you to walk around it seven times. And then when you are tired, I need you to take your tired voice and shout. Now, that don't make sense. But it makes sense when God is the one telling you to do it. And so this is why you and I have to lean on God's strategies. God is meticulously preparing Every event, every circumstance, every situation with our best interest in mind. That's what blesses me about this text. That this text teaches us that God is actually thinking about us. That even when he takes us spaces and places and routes and reroutes that we don't desire. He's doing so with our best interest in mind. Because God knows us so well that he knows our thoughts and our propensities. 
before we even think or feel them. He knows what our tendencies will be. He knows what we will experience. And somebody here, you ought to thank God because you can testify that even though the road that I was on has been difficult and it's taken longer than I expected, I thank God that God has taken me down this road because I am convinced that God knew that what I needed in that moment. He knew that the fastest route wouldn't have been the best route because the fastest route would have been the route that would have made me fight when I wasn't ready to fight. God knew this, so God said, I can't let you go this way because if I let you go this way, you're going to have to face enemies you ain't quite ready for. I love that because God says I had to confuse the children of Israelites just so that I can save them from a conflict that they knew, that he knew rather, that they were not ready for. I love that. That's, that's God's protective custody and his providential care because God ain't going to ever put you in a fight that you ain't prepared for. I don't know about you, but I've been walking with God long enough now that I can thank God for the fact that God knows what God is doing. I can think of moments from my own perspective that were more simple. It would have been more simple if I would have just did what God told me to do the way God told me to do it. God says, I, I want you to go another route. God says, I know what I'm doing. My plans for you are far more superior than what you can humanly understand. God's ways are not our ways. Neither is his thoughts our thoughts. And so based on what he knows, God determines which road is best for us. And I don't know about you, but I thank God that God knows what I can handle. Here's the next thing this text teaches us. It teaches us to take a piece of your past as a reminder of God's promise. I'm in verse 19. The Bible says Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath. He said, God will surely come to your aid. And when he does, you got to carry my bones with you from this place. The Bible says that before Joseph dies, the last thing he requested was whenever. Everybody say Whenever. Whenever they got out of Egypt, don't leave him in Egypt, but take him with them to wherever they were going next. Let me tell you why this is significant. Moses, um, um, Josh, uh, Joseph rather, not Moses, before Moses shows up on the scene, you know the story, the latter part of Genesis is the story of Joseph. And Joseph literally saves the world as the number two man in Egypt. Pharaoh has a dream and the Bible says... But he has this dream that nobody can interpret it. Joseph shows up after being betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, arrested on trumped-up allegations, serving a prison sentence that did not um, bespeak his character. He got in trouble for doing the right thing. But it positioned him, talking about how God providentially places us and takes us a long way around, positions him in front of Pharaoh where he's able to interpret the dream and literally, Billy, save an entire nation and thus the entire world. Well, when the book of Exodus opens, the Bible says it's been some time now. Moses, I mean, jo Joseph has been dead for a minute now. And there have been generations in Egypt that have gone by. So many of them that at this point, the current Pharaoh doesn't know who Joseph is or what Joseph has done. He don't realize that the only reason he's alive to be king is because of what Joseph did. That's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother day. But the Bible says, Genesis chapter 50, that before Joseph dies, he makes his brothers swear an oath and they pass it down from generation to generation. And Joseph says to his brothers, I'm about to die now. But I want you to know before I die, God is certainly, absolutely, surely going to come to your aid and bring you from this land and take you to the land, because this ain't the land, to take you to the land that God promised 
our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And don't miss it. When God does come to your aid, make sure that somebody carries my bones up from here. In other words, you better not leave me here where you found me. <laughs> Take me with you wherever you go. Because while I am thankful, Joseph says, for what Egypt did for me, Egypt is not the place that God promised. And so the Bible says Moses, as they're preparing to leave, grabs Joseph's bones as a reminder, first of all, of God's ability to always be faithful. And so can you, can you imagine Moses is getting ready to lead these two million people out of Egypt into the wilderness. They got all this stuff with them. They tying stuff down. And... Uh, Moses says to somebody, hey, somebody, go dig up Joseph. I know we got all this stuff around here, but I need somebody to make room on a wagon for Joseph's bones. I want to suggest that carrying Joseph's almost 400-year mummy back to Canaan was visible proof that God will always keep God's promises. I don't know who this is for. No, I know who it's for. It's for me. Because sometimes God's promises take a while to fulfill. It's been 400 years, but 400 years prior to it ever showing up, Joseph already knew what was going to happen. And I don't know who I'm preaching to this weekend, but I want to suggest to somebody that this may be a good thing. This may be a good place for you to find a space within yourself that even when your spirit is broken because of the unrelenting difficulties and even when you feel trapped by an impossible situation, when you find yourself wandering in what appears to be an aimless, dry, barren desert that before you leave for the journey, you ought to carry something with you from your past as a reminder that where I am is not where God promised. This is cool for right now. I'm starting to feel preached, Josh. But this is not what God has promised. Somebody here, you need to go back and do your mental health a favor and grab a visible reminder of God's faithfulness to you in times gone by as a reminder to God's plan, of God's plan rather, for him to be permanently faithful. Now, I know they tell us sometimes we ought not dig up our past too often. But the truth is, some of us need a piece of our past to go with us. As a reminder, very simply, watch this, that God is a God who has the capacity to always keep God's word. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but history and hope are inextricably tied to one another. And so when you find yourself in a space of hopelessness about what will be, every now and then you ought to grab an artifact that has history of what God has already done. You bet not be afraid to bring a piece of your history with you. Somebody here, you need to keep a past due bill around just as a reminder of what it looks like now to have money when there were seasons when you didn't know where money was coming from. You ought to bring a picture of, of, of an ex. Just just keep it around. You ain't got to dig it up all the time, but bring a picture of an ex. As a, in fact, bring a couple of them as a reminder of what foolishness the Lord has delivered you from. You better not be quick to throw out them big pair of pants because God needs a reminder of what you can do when you find yourself in a space and you wonder, am I cute enough or am I pretty enough? Am I handsome enough? Keep them big pants as a reminder of what the Lord has already done. Pull out a check stub from the company that fired you as a reminder of how God stretched their severance until you got the new contract. I know some of you you got degrees now but every now and then you ought to pull up the rejection letter from the university who said you didn't have what it took to matriculate through their education system. I know you live in Circle C and in Terra Vista now but every now and then go by the apartment in the 2-3 to remind you of how God I kept a roof over your head. Is there anybody here who can say I'm going to bring a piece of the past just as a reminder that the same God who did it then will do it again?
Don't throw it all away. Keep a piece of it with you as you travel along the journey. That's why I shout every time I get a chance because in my mind I got a mental Rolodex of all the things the Lord has brought me from and I can call it up so much now that you can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. I'm done. I'm done. Here's the last thing. I'm done. I'm done. Here's the last thing. When you got to go the long way around, trust the process. Treasure the fact that God knows what's best for you. He's not going to take you in a place that you ain't prepared for. Here's the next thing. Take a piece of your past with you as a reminder of what God has done. So that as you navigate where you are right now, you remember God's faithfulness. Here's the last thing this text teaches us. Be thankful for God's presence. <laughs> Friend, the truth of the matter is for these Israelites, the path that they were on was indeed uncertain. But while the path was uncertain, God made sure that God's presence was certain. The text says the children of Israel have now left Egypt, and now they're bordering the edge of the wilderness. And as they are, the Bible says in verses 21 and 22, um, that God provides his presence. We talked about how God demonstrated his providence. We talked about how God gave them his promise. But to be sure, he made sure that he didn't just leave them with providence and a promise. He left them. And guided them with his presence. And friend, that's good news to me to know that even in uncertain paths, I can take confidence in God's presence. That even when I don't know where I am, God loves me enough to not let me fend for or figure things out by myself. Did, did, I, did I tell you it's Pentecost Sunday? Because that's what the Holy Ghost is. It is the in, he is the indwelling presence of God to help lead us and guide us and help us to experience the best that God has to offer. He gives them, the, gives them a picture of his presence through the pillar of cloud by day. Pillar of fire by night. This pillar is symbolic of God's presence. God says, I want to localize my presence. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. God says, I want to localize my presence among my people. Because I want to localize my presence, the Bible says that he manifested his presence in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I love it because what this reminds us, Denise, is that God isn't just interested in leading us from places of oppression. But it also means that he has a plan to lead us into the promised land that he promised us. What this teaches us, friends, is that God is not indifferent toward our struggles. He manifests his presence day and night. It's the picture, it's a picture rather of the reality that no matter where they went, God's presence was continuous. Everybody say continuous. continuous. Verse 22 indicated, indicates rather the continuous nature of God's presence, that God would always be there. I love it because no matter where we are, God is always there. I need this to sit on somebody now. That wherever you are, God is there. One more time. That wherever you are, God is there. What I love about this presence is that it is a particular presence. This is no ordinary experience. It is unmistakably unprecedented and unique. God says, I want to be whatever you need me to be whenever you need me to be. He shows up as a cloud in the day and fire at night. He shows himself as one who can be concealed and revealed at the same time. 
pillar of cloud by day. He shows up as that pillar of cloud to prevent them from being exhausted as they traveled in the heat of the day in the desert. But he also shows up as a pillar of fire by night because deserts get equally cold. But he also wanted to protect them from the vulnerabilities that lurked in the night. So he demonstrates his faithfulness continuously, unprecedented, particularly to remind the children of Israel that as long as you let me lead you, whatever you need me to be, I can be that for you. You need wisdom to navigate the difficulties of the day, I got you. And if you need somebody to help you deal with the dangers that lurk in the night, I can do that for you as well. And friend, as I push toward the close, that's God's word for somebody in this room this weekend. That whatever you need me to be, if you let me lead you, I'll be that for you. It's a particular presence, but it's also a reflection of God's progressive presence. Friends, these clouds were not static clouds. These clouds moved. <laughs> they didn't stay in one space. They literally went ahead of them, leading them and allowing them to go far enough ahead of them to where they were able to adapt to their new environment. And all the people of God had to do in order to know where to go was to follow the cloud. And if the cloud moved, they moved. And if the clouds didn't move, they didn't move. And God says to somebody here, you need to understand that as I lead you, you better not jump ahead of me. Where's that great theologian of the church, uh, not of the church, of the culture? When I move, you move. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> and so we don't move until God moves. And even if that means you got to stay in a place that you don't like longer than you desire, you better learn how to sit there. Because many of us wear scars on our bodies and mental scars on our souls from jumping ahead of God. And we find ourselves saying far too many often, far too many moments, uh, uh, far too often in so many moments, if I would have just did what the Lord told me to do, I wouldn't have to deal with this one or that one. I wouldn't have these issues. The Lord told you, just wait a couple months, but you just had to go buy it. <laughs> and now you're dealing with debt unnecessarily. And you can't even enjoy it because it's broke and you can't afford to get it fixed. <laughs> I ain't got no help in this black Baptist church. <laughs> That's all right, I'm moving. Here's the last thing. I'm having way too much fun. Let me get y'all out of here. It, it's a particular presence. It is a progressive presence, but the cloud is also a picture of God's persistent presence. I'm done, but notice that just because it was a moving cloud, it did not move so fast that it left the children of Israel behind. This cloud was a changing cloud, Mr. Gregory. And though it was a changing cloud, it was a cloud that served as a continuous presence. To remind us that you and I don't have to worry about the journey because you are not traveling by yourself. This cloud serves as a reminder that you don't have to fear because you ain't traveling by yourself. You ain't got to be worked up about what ain't working out because you're not traveling by yourself. You have God's perpetual presence going ahead of you to provide for you and you've got God's presence standing as a guard to protect you. I thank God that I've got a God who will not leave me. I give God praise that no matter where life has taken me and no matter what decisions I've had to endure, I have always been covered by God's divine companionship. I got to get y'all out of here, but I was thinking about this as I was as I was putting this sermon together, and uh, when we went elementary school, before the day got started, the teacher would always take the role. Anybody remember that? So every day, before the lessons start, the teacher would get out her attendance sheet, 
begin to call names of the students in the room in alphabetical order. And our job was when we, held, when we heard our name, tell me what you're supposed to do. Present here, present, present here. And so Joanna, the teacher, would start out, Adam, present. Brooks, present. <laughs> Carter, present. <laughs> Coatney, Pre Davis, Pre Fernandez, presence. Jeter, Pre so on and so forth. And in the event that the person was not there, what would happen? You normally wouldn't hear anything. Do you know why I'm giving God glory this weekend? Because, friends, there has never been a day, a place, or a situation that I have been in that when I called out God's name, I'm done, y'all, I'm ready. God didn't yell, present. And I wonder, is there anybody in the room who when you look back over your life and you take the role of your own journey, you can help me thank God for the fact that God has never been silent or absent in your life. I give God praise this weekend that God is a God who has always had perfect attendance. In my good days, he was present. In my bad days, he was present. At the divorce court, he was present. On my wedding day, he was present. At the car lot, he was present. At the foreclosure lot, he was present. In seasons of darkness, he was present. And in seasons of prosperity, the Lord has been present. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. What have you needed God to do? That when you called out his name, he yelled out present. Is there anybody with here who can thank God that God has been with you every day of your life? His presence to comfort you. His presence to strengthen you. His presence to lead you and to guide you. To give you peace when you had no earthly reason for peace. And because I've got his presence, presence as a guide leading me along the long way around. Can I give you what my prayer is? Every day before I walk out the house, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. And when I go in this dry, dusty world, I need you, Lord, to open up the crystal fountain. Whence thy healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillow lead me all my journey through. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. And is there anybody here who can help me thank God that even if you got to take the long way around, you've got God's presence going before you and standing behind you, leading and guiding. And so if you're grateful that he never leaves nor forsakes, open your mouth and give him praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord I'm broken, but he's been with me. I'm battered, but he's been with me. I'm struggling, but he's been with me. And because he's been with me, I'm not going to leave him like he's never left me. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. I'm done. Everybody stand to your feet all over the church. We're going home. I want to talk to somebody really quickly before we open up the doors of the church. I just heard the Lord say, this is why you ought not be afraid to take a journey of therapy. 
Somebody, you've been on the fence. You're like, you really been on the fence? I know what it's like to be on the fence. Because I'm Pastor V. <laughs> As if that actually means something. But in my mind, I'm Pastor V. And um, so for a long time, I, 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 I just said, I got Jesus. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to deal with it. It wasn't until I trusted that God is on that couch like he is in the sanctuary. <laughs> Listen, take my money anytime. Do you hear me? Because it gives me an opportunity. And for somebody here, you just need the space to be heard. And so take, take, take the next. We got a whole bunch of them here. All of them are great. I know a few of them personally. They like for real, for real good. Before you leave, find one of these people in green and get connected on the journey because I assure you, you're going to feel God's presence in ways. Anybody been on the therapy journey? Anybody been on that journey? You feel God's presence in ways. You're able to think your way clear. And, uh, and so this is also why I want to invite somebody to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because whether you know it or not, you've heard me say this a time or two. Even when you were in spaces that you had no business being, God is so much God because he's omnipresent. That even in the spaces you had no business being in, whether you knew it or not, God was there. And he protected you for a moment like this so that you can surrender to his leadership. So if you're here this weekend, you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, to surrender your life to him and let him guide your life. And even if he guides you along a way that doesn't quite make sense to you, trust that his plan for you is for good and never for evil to bring about an expected end. Say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do that for those of you who are in this room. To my left and your right, as soon as this worship experience is over with, See those people there? My brother Deacon Kevin Enders is standing as one of the representatives of members of our decision team who will walk you through the beginning stages of your salvation journey. Or maybe you want to be a part of this church, a church that not only speaks to the beauty of what it means to walk with Christ, but to speak in a way that's relevant to the ways in which you live your life. You want to be a part of this church. We ain't no perfect church. We wouldn't dare claim to be. And even if we were, we couldn't have been because they let me be a part of it. <laughs> so if I'm here, you can be here. So if you need to be connected to this community of faith, we would love to journey with you to wherever God is leading you, which ultimately we know leads in a promise. Our pastor would absolutely love to be your pastor. We would love to be your brothers and sisters in the faith. If you want to make those decisions and you're watching us online, you're not in this room, you too can make those same decisions. Dial that number on the screen, 877 Six three two zero seven zero two.